Okay, so last section we're going to look at uh, this week is 11.2, and it's on what we call a series. Does anybody remember, what does the word finite mean? As an end. As an end. Yep. So whatever, we're whatever a series is, which we're going to talk about in a minute, a finite one is one that ends. And an infinite one, would what would that mean? It doesn't end. It doesn't end. It's, it's a series, whatever that is, that goes on forever. All right, so in the last section, this is the notation that we use to describe a sequence. Lowercase letter for the name of the sequence, and then a subscript that gives you the position. So for example, a sub one would be the term in the first spot of sequence A. A sub two would be the second term. So I want to look at this sequence. A sub n equals 2n minus 1 squared. Let's, let's write out some of the some of the terms. So position. Again, that'll be indicated by n. I don't know why they always use n, but that's usually what they use. And then the term in that position. Let's just write out. Uh, the first five. So if I want to know what the first term is, what number would I plug in for n? One. Let's do it. What's two times one? Two. two. Minus one? Yeah. And what's one to the second power? Yeah. One. So the first term is a one. Let's do the second term. So now we're going to plug in a two. What's... Actually, you know what? I'll show you something. What's two times two? Four. Four. Minus one, three, and it's three squared. Which is nine. It's nine. Let's just leave it as three squared. But yeah, it, it is nine. Now let's do the third one. What's uh, two times three? Six. Six, and then minus one. Five. It's five squared. And what's what's the next one going to be? Seven. Seven squared, and the next one after that. Seven. That's why I started writing it like that, so you could see a pattern. It's Odd numbers squared. That's the that's the pattern. If you write it as 1, 9, 25, 49, 81, I don't think you would see the pattern as easy. But we will we, we can write those numbers out if we want. But that's what they are. Okay, so any questions on how we got those terms? Alright, now what I want to do is look at this sequence. Yeah, and I can write these out if you want. This is 1, 9, 25, 49, 81. Those are the first five terms in my sequence. We're going to add them up. Now, you don't always add them all up. They'll tell you how many they want you to add up. When you see a capital letter S, that means sum. It means you're going to add some things up. The number that you put right here is how many you're going to add up. So if you see something like S sub 1, it means to take this sequence of numbers and add up the first one terms. So if you add up the first one terms in that sequence, uh, what do you get? 1. You just get 1 squared, which is 1. Now, S sub 2 means to add up the first 2. 1 squared plus what? 3 squared. So that's 1, for one squared plus 3 squared. And that gives me 10. So that is S sub 2. It's the sum of the first 2. Right, let's do S sub 3. What would I be adding together to get S sub 3? The first 3. First 3. 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared. Well, that's 25 plus 10. That's 35. And then if we wanted to add up the first n terms, we don't know how many there are. 
So you take the first one, plus the second, plus the third, plus the fourth, all the way till you get up to that number, whatever that number is. In this case, I just let it be n. So that would be my nth term. You double it, minus 1, and square it. That, that's the pattern. Yeah. So if it just says Sn, do you just add all them up? If it just says S sub n, you write it just like this. You'd have to add up the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. We don't know how many. Do you have to put a total or like just that? That's all you can put because you don't know how high to go. Like if this was a 50, then I would stop with 2 times 50 minus 1 and square. But I'd have to do 49, 48, 47. I'd do every one of them. When it's just an n, we don't, we don't know how high to go. So that's how we represent it. Now, the problem with doing a sub 50 is what I, what I just said. You'd have to do the sum of the first 50. That means, first of all, you have to find the first 50, and then you have to add them all up. Well, it would be easier if we could look at these numbers and try to find a pattern for the ones I circled in red. Because these numbers are the sums. If we could find a pattern for those, then we could predict what the first 200 add up to very quickly. But we need to figure out a pattern in these numbers, like what's happening. And so we'll, we'll talk about how you can find a pattern in the added up numbers. That's called a series, when you add them all up. Any question on that idea? Some are easy to find a pattern for, some, some are not. So we're, we're going to try to do some ones that are easier that we can get patterns for. So each one of those things that I just found, S sub 1, S sub 2, and S sub 3, those were called finite series. It's finite because I didn't add up infinitely many things. In S sub 1, I only added up one thing. S sub 2, I added two things. S sub 3, I added three. It was, there was an end. So there were only a finite number of terms in each sum. We are not going to talk about adding up infinitely many things today. You can do it, but you can't. You can't think about it like you would just press all the buttons on a calculator and just try to add up infinitely many things. There's too many to add up. It's going to take too long. So if we want to add up an infinite amount of things, we have to think about the problem in a totally different way. So I want to go back for a second to those numbers I circled in red. And you know what? Let's even do one more. So we have S1, S2, S3. Let me write down S4. What would I add up to get S4? The first four. Yep, I just have to add 49 onto the answer I just had. So this was 25 plus 10 is 35. What's 35 plus 49? 84. Yep, 84. So here's another one. Now, think about those four sums that we just found. 1, 10, 35, 84. Let me write those down. 1, 10, 35, 84. Each one of these numbers represents a sum. This is called a sequence of sums. That's what this is. Because each one of these is found by adding up some numbers to get it. So this is called a sequence of sums. And the goal is to find a pattern, like what, what would the next one be? That's what we want to be able to figure out in a quick way. So let me write that down. 
So on the last page, I wrote down S1, comma, S2, comma, S3, comma, S4, and then I stopped. When you write something like that, that's called a sequence of partial sums. So each term represents adding up a certain amount of items from another sequence. How many items? Depends on what term you're looking at. If you're looking at the third term, you must have added up three things to get that. If you're looking at the twelfth term, you added up twelve things to get that. And here's how you can write it a bit more general. The first partial sum is always just your first term. There's nothing, there's nothing to add up there. The second partial sum is when you add up the first two. The third partial sum is when you add up the first three. The fourth partial sum is when you add up the first four. Twentieth would be when you add up the first twenty. And we can, we can keep going. It's, it's a little hard to think about it first. But that's, that's all that all mm -hmm. this is. It's just adding up a bunch of numbers. How about if I wanted to find like the, the ninth partial sum? How many things would I add up to find that? Nine. nine. I'd add up the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. I'd have to add nine things together to get the ninth partial sum. What, what would I add together? Well, they'd give me a formula to do that. All right, so writing out a really long sum it's kind of annoying, right? Let's say I wanted to make, I wanted to represent adding up every number from one to one hundred, and I wanted you to write it out. If you had to write that out, you'd have to write out. I mean, you got to keep going until you write down every single number. Well, there's a faster way to write down something like this without writing it all out. And I'm going to show you what, what that is. It's called sigma notation. And the reason it's called that is because it's going to use a Greek letter, specifically a capital Greek letter, called sigma. Capital sigma looks like this. That's a capital sigma. That's drawn pretty well. As I start going faster and faster, my sigmas start looking pretty bad. But that's how it should look. All right, so how does it work? So let's say I wanted to add up a bunch of terms in a sequence. Okay, how many? I don't know, n of them. What's n? I don't know, a really big number. Maybe it's 600. Okay. I want to add up a certain amount of terms in the sequence. There's three things we need to know. Where we're going to start adding numbers up, where we're going to stop, and what's the formula that's generating the numbers you're adding up. Like I think in the first one we did, it was 2n minus 1 squared. Yep. So when you want to add up a bunch of terms, we need to know where to start, where to stop, and what is the formula that we use for making the terms we're going to add together. And that's what it looks like. That is the formula. That's usually given to you. It's the formula that represents how you're generating the terms you're adding up. Yeah, no. 
this is a start value. In this particular case, we would be starting with the first term, because k equals 1. Do you always start with the first term? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I guess you could add up the third through the sixth terms, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We don't usually do that. We usually start with the first term. And this is where we stop. So this tells you what term you're going to start with adding up. This term tells you which one you're going to stop at. And this is a formula that's generating the actual numbers that you're going to add up. And that's how you pronounce it. It's pronounced as the sum from something to something of my formula. In this case, the sum from the first term to the nth term of, and then you say your formula that you're using to add them all up. I'll show you an example with, with numbers. This isn't something we could actually do anything with because there's no formula here. That, that's just representing the formula. You, you'd have to put something there. And you have to put something here, too. You have to put a number to stop. Um, this is called an index, the k value. It's just called an index. It's not really super important that you remember that, but uh, you see the word index? It just means it's the value you're going to start at. Right, so let me show you an actual example with numbers, with a formula, and we'll kind of break it down and see what it means. So there's an actual example. So that example is having you add five numbers together. How do I know? Well, it says to start at one, and it says to stop at five. So how many numbers are there from one to five? One, two, three, four, five. So I'm adding five things together. What are the things I'm adding together? They're generated by this formula. 2k plus 3. So let's write out what that means. You start at 1, you stop at 5, and you plug every number, one at a time, from 1 to 5, into that formula, and write down the answer. So we'll start with 1. If we plug in 1, what's 2 times 1? 2 plus 3? 5. There's your first number. This sigma means you're adding. It always means sum. Now we need the second number. So now we're going to let k equal 2. I'm going to go up. Plug in a 2. What's 2 times 2? 4. Plus 3? 7. 7. That's the second number we're adding out. We have to keep going till we get to 5. One at a time. Now we do 3. What's 2 times 3? 6. And 6 plus 3? 9. So now we're at 3. The next one is 4. What's 2 times 4? 8. Plus 3? Now we get 11. Now we go up one more, and this is the last one. Because now we've reached the number at the top. We're at 5. What's 2 times 5? Plus 3? 13. There you go. What's on the left means what we just did on the right. That's what it means. It doesn't give you the answer to it. It just tells you a quick way of writing down what you want to say. Right? Instead of having to write 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 plus 13. So is there any question on how we turned what was on the left 
into what's on the right. Start at this number and plug it into your formula and keep going up by one with that number, plugging it in until you get to the top number. But then you still have to add it all up. But I'm not worried about that. So when you write something with this symbol and you give somebody a start point, a stop point, and a formula, that's called sigma notation. When you write it all out like we did, plugging each number in one at a time, that's called expanded notation. Expanded notation could be very long to write. You had to add up 2,000 numbers. You only have to write plus, 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 plus 2,000 times. Put back up what we did for a second. Okay. What's in the red box? Is that sigma notation or expanded notation? That's sigma. And how about what's in the black box? That's expanded. You've, you've written it all out. Sigma notation, expanded. Any questions on that? So again, unfortunately, I mean, sigma notation looks pretty, it's great, but it doesn't really give you a quick way of finding the answer to the problem. It just gives you a quick way of writing down what you want to say. That's all it does. So like if I wanted to represent adding up the first 6,000 integers in this formula, well, there you go. I've represented what I wanted to say. This means add up the first 6,000 numbers in this formula. But what is the actual answer? I still can't. I can't do that quickly. Yet. Right, let's try this one. So where, where are we starting? We're starting at 1, and where are we stopping? So how did we represent where we're going to stop? Which is? It's what? So n stands for a number. So n is where we are stopping. So when we have to expand something, and we don't know how many terms to do, we know we're supposed to stop somewhere. We're just going to write out maybe the first three or four, and then put a dot, 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 and then we'll write the last one. Because we don't, we don't know how many there are. It stops somewhere. I don't, I don't know where. I know it stops at N, but I don't know the number. Okay, so let's start with one. Okay, so let's plug in one. Um, what's two times one? And plus three. And when we square that, let's just leave it as 5 squared. There's your first one. Um, Curtis, what would I plug in to get my second one? 2. two. What's 2 times 2? Two? Plus 3? Seven. Let's just leave it as 7 squared. So there's your second one. Right, let's do a third. Let's do a third and a fourth. And then we'll jump all the way to n. So now plug in a 3. Um, Tony, what's 2 times 3? Plus 3? Nine. And let's do one more after that. I think the person reading this gets the idea of the pattern. Uh, Cameron, what are we going to plug in to get the fourth one? Uh, it'll be 11 squared. Uh, yep, so 2 times 4 is 8 plus 3 is 11 squared. And now there might be a bunch more. How many more? I, I don't know. Could be a lot more. But what's going to be the last thing that we would plug into this formula? Uh, the 
plugged in one, plugged in two, plugged in three, and plugged in four, where should I stop? Even if it's not a number, that's okay. I know I should stop here. Yeah. The end term. The end term. So finish by plugging in n for k. So if I plug in n sample, would this say? Two n plus three squared. Yeah. Two n plus three squared. That's the very last term that you'd be adding up. What's the number for that term? I don't know. It depends what n is. But whatever n is, that's the one I would stop. Okay, so when you don't, when you have an n, my advice is just write the first four and then put plus, dot, 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 and then jump to the stopping point, which is n. And that's expanded notation. Questions on that? All right. So let's let's look at a couple properties of sums. You're going to see kind of some similarities here. Maybe if you remember distributive property, you might kind of see something that looks like that. And that's kind of what this first one is. And I'll, I'll do an example with numbers to show you. But if you have two different sequences, and you want to add them together, there's two ways you can add sequences together. And I'll show you an example of each, each way. Let's say that sequence A, I'm going to do very short, very simple sequence example. Let's say sequence A is the numbers 1, 3, and 5. And sequence B uh, is the numbers 2, 4, and 6. And I want you to add that all together. Let's start with the way on the right. When I just put a red box around, that means to start at the first term and add everything up. In this case, there's only three, but only focus on sequence A. So add everything up in sequence A. One plus three plus five. That's what that red box means to do. Add everything up in sequence A. And what, what is one plus three plus five? No. Plus, now this says start at the first term in sequence B, stop at the end, and add them all together. But now we're looking at just sequence B. 2 plus 4 plus 6. Whoa. 2 plus 4 plus 6. And that gives me 12. And now... There's a plus sign between the two, so add them together, and we get 21. That's what the way on the right is saying to do. The way on the left is a little bit different. It says to add each term in A to the corresponding term in B first. So you're going to add the sequences together term by term first. So what's 1 plus 2? 3. What's 3 plus 4? 7. And what's 5 plus 6? 11. So we added sequence A to sequence B first, one term at a time. Now it says to take the sum of all the numbers in the thing you just did. 3 plus 7 plus 11. What's 3 plus 7 plus 11? 21. So it's two different ways of adding sequences together. You can add all the numbers in the first sequence, get that answer. Add all the numbers in the second sequence, get that answer, and then add those together. Or add them together term by term, and then add all those together. 
two different ways of doing the same thing. I'm not going to go through the same example again, but if you can do it with addition, you can also do it with subtraction. If you want to subtract two sequences, you can subtract them one term at a time, write down all the answers you get, and then add them together. Or, I think the easier way is just add up all the numbers in the first sequence, 9, add up all the numbers in the second one, 12, and then just do 9 minus 12. So that's for subtraction. And the last one is for um, multiplication. Let me show you an example first with, with sequence A. So A sub K is 1, 3, 5. Let's say, um, say I want to double. I want to double that entire sequence and add it all together. So I want to find what happens when I double that entire sequence and add it all together. Two ways to do it. So let's double A sub K. Add it up. Let me show you the first way. The first way is to take the sequence and double each number individually. So let's double the 1, the 3, and the 5. Uh, what do we get if we double 1? 2. How about if you double 3? 6 and 10. So it says to double it and then add it all up. So if we add it all up, we get 18. So you can double each number one at a time and then add them up. Or just add them up first and then double it after. If we add these up, what's 1 plus 3 plus 5? 9. And what do you get if you double 9? 18. So you can do it either way. You can double each number one at a time and add it up. Or just add them all up and double that. And that that's what I'm going to write down right now. That's the third So the way on the left is saying it's like a distributive problem. You're multiplying a value to your sequence first. In my case, I used 2. You're multiplying each number in your sequence by a value, and then you're adding all those up. I think that's more work, because then you've got to multiply a number out every single time and then add it when you're done. It's easier to do it this way, which means do what's in the box first. Add everything together in your sequence, and when you're done, multiply by the number. That way you only have to multiply one time if you do it that way. But it will come out the same either way. Again, the sigmas are, are fine to write, but they don't actually give you a quick way of doing anything. They give you a quick way of writing what you want to do. So we need some ways to actually do the arithmetic fast. So if you want to add up, say, the first 5,000 terms in some sequence, double. Well, it's, it's going to take a while to do. So there's a few kind of common patterns that I'll that I'll show you. All right, let's look at this one. So we want to combine this into a single sum.
And the way you can combine this into a single sum is you can think of it as combining like terms. When you combine it, they both have to start at the same value, and they have to stop at the same value. When you combine it into one, you're only going to have one sigma. You're not going to have two anymore. Sigma. One sigma. Let's start with that. Where do you think this sigma is going to start? When we combine these two together. One. It's going to start at one. It has to start at exactly the same spot that the other two started from. And where do you think it's going to stop? N. It has to stop at the same spot that the other two stop. Now, we take this and this. Think of this as sequence A. Think of this as sequence B. And basically apply this rule right here. Instead of writing it as two separate sigmas, we're going to write it as one sigma that starts and stops at exactly the same spot as the other two. We're just going to take what was here and what was there and put them right next to each other with a single sigma. So let's, let's do that. So here's sequence A. And now sequence B. And there you go. Here's sequence A plus sequence B. Just combine it all together. Okay, so what's uh, what's going to be my k squared term? Yep, so we combine these, we get 6k squared. Uh, what's going to come next? Minus 2k, and then plus 3. So that's how you use one of those one of those properties that you should to combine two things together that were separate. Any questions on what we did there? Now, what if you had a subtraction here? What do you think you'd have to be careful about? Like what? What property do you think would come up if you had a subtraction sign here? So when I have subtraction here, what what would really be what would be subtracted? The seven and what else? The negative two k and and the k squared, that all would be subtracted. So if you had a subtraction sign here, that subtraction sign applies to everything. So you would just put a sign on the other side? Yeah. So you'd want to think of it like this. That's what you would be doing. 5k squared minus 4 minus 7. It would actually be a plus 2k and then a minus k squared. Okay, I'm going to switch it back the way it was, but I just want to show you. If it's subtraction, that negative is distributed to everything. I mean, technically, this plus sign is distributed to everything, but distributing a plus sign, that doesn't change anything. So we didn't have to worry about it. All right, so again, sigma notation, very compact. But what if you actually want to get an answer? Like, what do, this is an example of, if you plug in every number one at a time into this formula, start, stopping at 10, what would you get? So let's, let's start with 1. If you plug in 1 for this, what do you get? Just 1. What if you plug in 2? 2. It's a pretty simple formula. If you plug in 3? Three, 3. 3. You get whatever you plug in. And where are we stopping? Ten. Stopping at 10. We're basically adding up every number from 1 to 10. That's what this means to do. Now, if your 
clever, let me write it like this. You don't actually have to do that. You can notice a pattern. Because when you add numbers together, does it matter what order you add them in? No. No. So think, we're not going to quite do it this way, but this is kind of thinking we want to do. What's 1 plus 10? 11. What's 2 plus 9? 11. And then 3 plus 8? 11. All we have to do is figure out how many pairs we have and multiply it by 11. And that would add all those up for us. Yeah. Then we have 4 and 7 and 5 and 6. So we had 55. 5 pairs, yeah. So that would add up to 55 if you added it all up. So that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to try to figure out a clever way to add things up without actually doing it. We're going to look for, look for a pattern. So you would have it in all cases, you know, just that one. Yeah, there's always going to be a pattern. Yep, there's going to be some some type of, of pattern. All right, so what we want to avoid is having to add this all up by hand. The more kind of famous one you see is adding up every number from 1 to 100. And you end up with pairs of 101s, not 11s. In that case, it's pairs of 101s. And you end up with, I think, 50 pairs of 101 if you add up every number from 1 to 100. Yeah. So it should be 50 times 101, and that's the answer. So. All right, so I'm going to show you, uh, I think we're going to look at two, yeah, two formulas. How do we add up all these numbers with a, with a formula? We can look for a pattern every time, and that, that works. But I'm going to show you a, a trick to adding them up. Let's go back and look at this one. Adding up the numbers from 1 to 10. Um, let's see if I remember it. Um, what did we say all the numbers from 1 to 10 added up to? 55. All right, keep, keep that in mind for a second. How many numbers did we just add up from 1 to 10? 10. 10. What's 10 plus 1? 11. What's 11 times 10? And what's half of 110? 55. So we're not going to prove this, but this is the formula to add up numbers one at a time from one up to a number. So let's say you wanted to add up from one to five. Five plus one is six. Six times five is 30. And half of 30 is 15. So if you add up every number from one to five, you should get 15. Five plus four is nine. Nine plus three is 12. 12 plus two is 14. Plus one is 15. Kind of hard to figure this pattern out on your own. Uh, not something that's easy to do. Uh, but I'm just going to give it to you. That's what it is. Now, we can even go back one step from that. One, one, a little simple. Instead of adding up numbers that increase by one each time, let's just say we keep adding up the same number over and over. Let's say you did from k equals 1 to 5 of the number 8. If you plug in 1 into that formula, what do you get? There's no, there's no k to even plug into. So what it would just be what? Just be 8. Now plug in 2 into this formula. What do you get? 8. Plug in 3, what do you get? Plug in 4? 8. Plug in 5? 8. So basically we added 8 up how many times? Well, when you add the same number up over and over, we don't usually use addition. We use what? We use what? Multiplication. So if you want to add up the same number that many times, the pattern is going to be to just multiply these two together. 
That's an even. That's a little easier than the one I showed you first. And that's the first one I'll give you right here. If you want to add up the same number this many times, all you have to do is multiply that number times that number, and you'll get the answer to what it would add up to. That number times that number. So this is how you can add up a constant. There wouldn't even be a formula here. It would just be a number. That's how you can add up a constant over and over without having to actually do it. It's multiplication. Take your constant and multiply by how many times you added it together. So what if I had this? What would that add up to? 60. Yep. This means to start at 1, plug 1 into this formula, which doesn't even really have a formula, so it's always going to be a 5, and you're going to do that 12 times. 5 plus 5, 12 times is 60. And this is the one I just showed you. This is one, one step harder than, than the last one. You're not adding up the same number over and over. You're adding up numbers that go up by 1. So like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, as high as you want to go. So you're adding up integers. So it gives you a way to figure out what this is without having to do it. So let's say I wanted to add up the first 20 integers. 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up to 20. All you have to do is plug 20 into this formula. What's 20 plus 1? So 21. And then we would do 21 times 20. So let's see what that is. 21 times 20 is 420. Yep. And then divide by 2. So if you want to add up every number from 1 to 20, it adds up to 210. So we don't want to have to do it by hand. We could add up 1 to 20. That's not bad. But let's say it was 1 to 2,000. It's too many. Questions on those two? We're not going to do the... Uh, we're not going to do that. All right. So let's see if we can simplify something like that. So the way you simplify it is you're going to do two things. First, you're going to use the rules that I showed you right here. So we're going to use those. And then you're always going to end up using one of these two formulas at the end. Can I please have everyone? So to simplify that, you've got to make this look like one of these two. You can either have a constant here, or you can have just a k. But you cannot have something added together like that. So think of this as a sub k. Think of this one as b sub k. We're going to split it apart. We're going to try to simplify it by taking it out what we can, because that's that's too complicated. And here is the formula you're going to use. We have two things in the same sigma. Separate them each into their own sigma to make each one of these a little bit, little bit easier to work with. So we're going to take what's together and separate it. When I separate it, I'm going to have two sigmas. Where are they each going to start? One. They're each going to start at 1. Where are they each going to stop? And then N. Right, so let's write two of them. You're going to put a plus sign because that's what was in the problem. Plus sign. Each start at 1. Each stop at N. And the goal is to try to make what we put here simpler than what we had here. What do you think would be my first... My first thing right next to that sigma. Negative 2k. 
I'm going to put a negative 2k. And what would I put right here? 3. Ah, this last one matches something we just talked about. You're adding up the number 3 this many times. So that part would be 3n. When you have a number, when you have a letter on top, to simplify it, all you have to do is take your number, multiply it by the letter on top, and it turns into that number times n, which in this case is 3n. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a second. This one is almost like the one with a k. Almost. The only problem is we have a negative 2 with the k. We have a number in front of the k. Let's go back and look at this for a second. If you have, uh, let's see, this is the number, and it's in front of our formula. Where can we put this number if we don't want it right in front of the sequence? Where? We can move it to the outside. That's perfectly fine to do. So let's move that number out in front of the sigma. So we're going to try to simplify what's right here even a little more. Let's move our number to in front. Okay, so what's the number that we have in front of k? Negative 2. Because of, I think it was rule 3, you can take that number and put it in front. So it's negative 2 times the sum from k equals 1 to n of k plus the sum from k equals 1 to n of 3. Now, at this point, hopefully we can look at it and match this up with a formula from the other page and match this up. The negative 2 is just going to stay right where it is. This is the sum from k equals 1 to n of k. Does that look like either rule 1 or rule 2? Which one? The sum from k equals 1 to n of k. I think it looks more like rule 2. The sum from k equals 1 to n of k. That can turn into that. So we can get rid of this and change it to that. How did we get this? You don't have to worry how to prove this. That's, that's, that's kind of hard to prove. But it does equal that. So n times n plus 1 over 2. So this part turns into n, n plus 1 over 2. And what about this part on the end? From k equals 1 to n of a constant. Yeah? That's number one. That's rule number one. K equals one to n. In my case, the constant was three. Mm -hmm. So what, what would this all turn into? Three times n. Three times n. Um, what's going to cancel out in this first one? Two. Yeah, you're going to multiply by two, but then you divide by two, so the twos are gone. So we have negative n times n plus 1 plus 3n, and then just distribute it out. That's negative n squared minus n plus 3n. So it's just combining like terms from here. And we'll, we'll, we'll practice some more of those tomorrow. We only, we only got through one, but we'll, we'll, we'll try some more. Put up uh, the homework. Okay, one through five, that's fine. Um, let's do 
Uh, I gotta fix this. Seven and eight. And nine, we're not gonna do. Eleven, we're not gonna do. Uh, I think I think that's good. So one through five, seven and eight. Seven and eight is the very last thing we did, so if you get stuck on it, um, don't don't worry too much. Remember, we have a whole extra day this week to review. So even if we don't finish tomorrow, that's fine. Plenty of time to review.